Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I'm not sure it's going to be a lecture today so much as a, um, I hope, a connected series of recollection and reminiscences um, about um, my time in New Zealand, Canada, and in England. I'd like to open by thanking the hosts, uh, two sets of hosts I'd like to thank. First of all, the College of Law, the Dean and the Professors for the welcome you've given me, particularly last night. Uh, this seems to me is less a visit than a homecoming. Uh, during 1980, 1981, as I will explain, I spent what was, for me, a transformative year that has shaped my career and had a very um, important influence. I have a profound debt to the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan and the hospitality that it showed me as um, a rather callow uh, young man. So my first thanks are to the College of Law. Secondly, um, the other hosts, of course, are the First Nations of Saskatchewan, on whose ground I am privileged to be speaking this afternoon. Uh, in, I'm speaking now in New Zealand terms. In New Zealand, uh, to have a university for a Maori iwi tribe nation within your roha, within your territory, is a matter of considerable honour and dignity, or mana, um, because it brings to your territory young people to learn, build, form careers, and to bring prosperity, scholarship, and dialogue from all traditions. So um, I thank the First Nations for that. Um, the tradition of which I am about to speak, uh, I wanted to say from the outset, is located entirely within what the Australians would call the House of White Fellows Thought. I am a Western academic and I am located inside, entirely inside a Western tradition, though I will be speaking about, of course, its engagement with Indigenous peoples. So I'd like to start off by um, thanking my hosts. If I were opening in a New Zealand setting, uh, there is a Māori tradition that accompanies um, the beginning of a talk such as this, and this is you establish what is known as your whakapapa. Your whakapapa is the genealogical ties that you have uh, through blood, marriage, uh, and contact with the hosts. The purpose of Whakapapa is to establish a connection with your hosts so that um, you can Whakapapa in, so that you can talk and you can do what all families do, you can argue, um, but you do not um, resort to violence. So the establishment of ties is a way in which families exchange greetings and ideas and conversation and food and hospitality is shared. Um, so I would like, first of all, to mention two figures who were um, very kind and generous to me here, who are no longer with us. Uh, that's Roger Carter and Howie McConnell. Um, the Carter family continues to show great kindness um, to me, and I think, and hospitality. Um, and I also like there's one figure too I want to mention. When Dwight asked me in Toronto, uh, last year, if I'd be interested in coming to Saskatchewan, I said yes, because I would particularly, particularly like to see Beth, so um, <laughs> Professor Bilson. Um, Jeff, Kate and Max also were um, very hospitable and kind to me during my graduate year, so I want to thank you for that. Um, my, um, I'm going to describe the intellectual journey that I've been on. Um, it's bound in with the people I have met and the friendships that I have formed their examples, their generosity, and sometimes the arguments I've had with them. I'm going to, make, I'm going to be making a series of um, utterly banal points as I go, but they're important ones to remember. And this is that um, the scholarship that I have been engaged upon is ultimately a, a, um, a profoundly human experience. Uh, this is something that um, courts in particular are, are apt to forget, and I'm one or two scholars. So we come to 1980, 1981. Uh, the setting of time and place is um, this New Zealand student coming here to um, do my, begin my, well, com complete an LLM in the space of a very, very busy year. Uh, Canada, at the time, was about to, was just entering into the patriation controversy. That uncorked during my time here, and it was a topic of much discussion in the faculty common room amongst the public lawyers. Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister. Saskatchewan then was the provincial government, was the NDP, 
Alan Blakeney was the um, Premier and Roy Romanov was his Attorney General. The College of Law itself was beginning to grow or thinking about its future direction. The Native Law Centre was across the road in a small house. It had a director of um, research there who was about to leave and Norman Zlotkin was going to replace him. Uh, his name was Brian Slattery. Uh, he had recently completed his PhD in 1979, Hillary term, at Oxford University, uh, and his PhD was beginning to become uh, a publication of much interest. I say publication of much interest because his wife, Mary Ann, was Director of Publications at the Native Law Centre, and she made sure that uh, the Native Law Centre earned a lot of money through the reproduction of Brian's PhD dissertation. Um, mine was subsequently to go into an underground circulation, nothing quite like Brian's <laughs> achieved, and courtesy of many photocopiers. Uh, Brian had a research assistant who was about to go over to Oxford to commence his PhD. His name was Kent McNeil. Um, they were subsequently to become the two most cited authors in the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, but we didn't know that at the time, of course. You don't know these things at the time. And that's going to be another thing I'm going to come to. Um, as part of my uh, graduate program, I had weekly meetings with academics. I had topic from topic to topic. Um, so I mixed um, freely with um, Richard Bartlett, Eric Colvin, Doug Schmeiser, and Beth Bilson. I can still remember a comment Beth uh, wrote on an essay that I'd completed about taxation and um, First Nations. And she said that he could sharpen it by being clearer about the periods of which he is speaking when he uses the past. I remember that because I'm going to be coming back to that in a moment. So um, this was my introduction to common law Aboriginal title when I came to Canada in 1980. It was then very much the buzz concept. The call to case in 1973 uh, was a case that was regarded as having um, radically changed the terms of engagement between the Crown and First Nations. Uh, the Baker Lake case, a judgment of Marnie at first instance, was drawing a lot of attention and discussion, particularly in uh, the law legal periodicals. And the litigation in the Gurin case was then in train. It was not until 1984 that the Supreme Court finally handed down uh, its judgment on the Crown's role in the negotiating the surrender of reserve land for leases of golf course in Vancouver. Of course, it's a famous case, but it was still in the system. The Calder case in 1973 is the legendary case in which the Supreme Court of Canada uh, indicated that the common law recognised the Aboriginal title of uh, First Nations. Until then, the courts had refused such recognition. The court famously divided um, Hall in the dissent um, and uh, Judson. Uh, they divided evenly on the question of existence and, and extinguishment. Uh, but the real ratio of quarter, of course, was the point of proceedings against the Crown and the um, fiat needed. So the quarter case is the landmark case for the recognition by courts of common law Aboriginal title. The Calder case, when I came to Canada, the Calder case, there was a great air of expectancy about it. It was believed that the, um, the, the Dominion was about to embark upon a very serious program of negotiation and settlement of claims. In fact, what followed Calder was largely an impasse. The Calder case had been designed to break a stalemate, but that stalemate still continued. That is to say, the expected pattern of negotiated settlements did not occur. The James Bay Agreement was really rather the exception. It was emblematic of a history that did not ripen or mature. So I arrived in Canada also when there was great talk of discussion of statutory land claims processes and mechanisms for this, so that the suggestion, essentially in the quarter case, 
could be operationalized through statute. Uh, when I was here, just as I was about to leave during the patriation controversy, First Nations commenced proceedings in Canada and in the United Kingdom courts and to placate First Nations who were worried that patriation could somehow compromise the formative jurisprudence suggested by Calder and Baker Lake. Section 35 was inserted by, well, was produced by Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, essentially, we saw it at the time as a face saver, as a defensive posture to ensure that, well, whatever rights they might have there will not be affected. So Section 35 was born in this way as to spare the Trudeau government from embarrassment. Trudeau was, of course, a law professor. He was a great believer in um, human rights and human rights instruments and the role of the courts. So part of the strategy by First Nations at the time had been to embarrass him with the suggestion that his charter uh, was uh, undermining what the courts were doing with regard to recognition of Aboriginal rights. It is worth remembering, too, that the first 10 years or so of Section 35's life in the Constitution Act 1982 was rather more iconic than real. The Supreme Court only looked at Section 35 once before the Sparrow case in 1991. I think it was a case called Kruger Emanuel. During that time, there were a series of constitutionally mandated conferences and outcomes, uh, Mitch Lake, Charlottetown, that did not ripen into a new constitutional settlement, uh, certainly as First Nations had hoped, and in many respects had led, been led to believe would be the outcome of those conferences. So the politics, the constitutional politics of the 1980s really were about um, obtaining some constitutional recognition and accommodation and that that did not occur. Uh, so First Nations in Canada during the 1980s were put at a junction. It's a junction at which they find themselves constantly and which constantly perplexes them, the junction between a political route and a legal route. So I'm going to talk about that and amplify that. In any event, I completed my LLM here in 1981 and uh, went off to Cambridge, where I completed my PhD on the Aboriginal rights of the New Zealand Maori at common law. Uh, in 1983, I wrote two audition pieces that subsequently were published. These were audition pieces because I didn't want to go back to New Zealand and I wanted to stay in England, so I had to get some kind of a job and I thought, I'll get a university job. So I had to produce two papers. Those two papers were subsequently published. One was the transposition of the Aboriginal title principles into a New Zealand setting called Aboriginal title in New Zealand courts. The other sought to apply those principles to an area where I argued there were unextinguished rights around the coastline of the country. I should explain that when I came here, Brian Slattery said or suggested that for my first two papers, I might like, before he left, he left at Christmas, so I only had two shots at Brian. And so he said, well, why don't you look at these New Zealand cases? I could never make sense of them. See what you can. So he sent me off. The outcome of it a year or so later was a rather jejune essay published by the Native Law Centre. But I looked at the question of Aboriginal title in a New Zealand setting, but informed, of course, by what the Canadian courts had been doing. So I was essentially the first New Zealand scholar to be taking the Canadian principles and applying them in a New Zealand setting. Groundswell of academic and judicial opinion began to agree with what I was saying, and not least the President of the New Zealand Court of Appeal, Sir Robin Cook, who later became Lord Cook, first uh, Commonwealth judge appointed to the uh, House of Lords, first law lord from a Commonwealth jurisdiction. The position I had taken was endorsed by the tribunal. That was to say, 
the, there was an acceptance that there were unextinguished Aboriginal title property rights around the New Zealand coastline. Some politicians worried about this. My former law professor, Geoffrey Palmer, was by then Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, and um, later I became quite close to the Attorney General, Sir Douglas Graham. In 1986, New Zealand had its version of the Calder case, a case called Tiwihi, in which, at first instance, the judge said there were unextinguished Maori fishing rights around the New Zealand coastline, and he cited those two junior essays that I had written. So, and by then had recently published. This resulted in the, what's called the Sea Lords Settlement. It was then worth 192 million New Zealand dollars. The Crown accepted the existence of commercial Maori fishing rights around the coastline, agreed a settlement with Maori, who obtained a percentage of the quota that the government was issuing. Uh, that also, I have to say, uncorked 10 years of internecine litigation amongst the Maori tribes um, before they finally agreed as to the allocation of the income, a very considerable income from these fishing rights. The issue, and this is an issue that also has also cropped up in Canada, was exactly who was the Crown making an agreement with when it made this pan-national settlement on sea fisheries? Was it making, uh, reaching an agreement with Maori as an ethnic group or was it reaching an agreement with Maori as a series of political formations as nations in an ongoing political relationship with the Crown? Well, eventually the Privy Council took the latter point and so uh, the urban groups were excluded from the settlement. This is a parallel, for example, with the Ontario litigation over uh, casino profits. So these questions recur um, quite commonly between juris jurisdictions. And this was a time when the Commonwealth scholarship on Aboriginal title was very, very much interested in what the other jurisdictions were doing. I began my academic career then as a um, Aboriginal title specialist, uh, very much on the lines of Brian Slattery and Kent McNeil, except I was the one doing it in New Zealand. Now, in the early 1990s, as I will explain, I reached my own junction. I'm only going to be explaining that more fully. I left Aboriginal title at that time, and I didn't return to it until 2003. In 2003, in a case called the Natiapa case, the New Zealand Court of Appeal recognised that there remained unextinguished Aboriginal title rights, apart from the commercial fishing ones, around the New Zealand coastline. The foreshore and seabed controversy became New Zealand's greatest political controversy of the new century. The historic relationship between Māori and the Labour Party was um, devastated, it collapsed as a result of this controversy. There were um, demonstrations on beaches, Outside Parliament, 50,000 people. It was a huge and immense political controversy. Um, and I was drawn back into this. And uh, I can never, <laughs> I won't forget, when I, mean, I met the Attorney General, Michael Cullen, he said, this is Paul McHugh. Ah, he said, where the trouble began. It actually began here in Saskatchewan um, when, <laughs> when um, I was first introduced to the principles of the common law. So... Uh, the, my, my year here had an effect in as much as the controversy in New Zealand on the seabed and the foreshore on the seabed goes back to um, my sitting with Brian Slattery in the College of Law discussing these principles and um, essentially um, sitting uh, at his feet and learning from him. In the early mid-1990s I reached a new junction I came to Canada and I was lucky enough and privileged enough to um, be taught by Brian Slattery and the people I have mentioned and then to be able to take those principles and transpose them into the New Zealand setting. So off I went to uh, Cambridge because I didn't want to go back to New Zealand and I thought, oh well, this education's a good thing, I, maybe I could just get another, some more money and go to Cambridge and uh, luckily, luckily I was able to do that. Uh, whilst I was in Cambridge, 
even though I was essentially still working on the principles I'd acquired in Canada, I was also absorbing another tradition, and this was the Cambridge tradition. And in the early, late 80s and early 90s, I began to face and explore this. Uh, it all went back to the comments that Beth had written on my essay on, on First Nations and Tax, and also to a comment that my PhD examiner said to me during my Viva Voce. Uh, this is a figure called Rosalind Higgins. Who later, she later became a judge on the International Court of Justice. And she said to me, well, she said, very interesting PhD. You've convinced me, but I'm not sure that it happened. I'll say that again. You've convinced me, but I'm not sure that it happened. And what does she mean by that? Well, essentially, the arg what she was saying was, well, it's a good legal argument. Common law Aboriginal title is a really good legal argument, but I'm not sure that officials and figures in the past were thinking that way. Come to that. So, in Cambridge, because of the collegiate system, you're sitting beside historians and people teaching sciences and medicine and uh, English literature, I became quite friendly with some of the historians there. And gradually I was exposed to uh, what is known as Cambridge contextualism. It is a method of writing the history of political thought associated with two figures, um, J.G.A. Pocock and Quentin Skinner. These are quite big figures in the humanities, and I was drawn into their writings and thinking about uh, the use of the past and how the past inhabits our present. As I began thinking about the way in which one writes and deals with the past, I began reading the works that had been written on this. And there's a whole tradition of reflection upon how we use the past and what the past is doing in our present day. And I found that it was, more than anything, a um, Cambridge tradition, with names like Seeley, Maitland, Butterworth, Oakeshott, Collingwood. Just as Aboriginal title essentially was a Western Canada phenomenon, so is Cambridge, Cambridge contextualism, this idea of consciousness about how we are using the past located there. So I've been very lucky in terms of time and place. To understand how the writers like Pocock and Skinner were operating, we need to think about what law and history are. In particular, we need to go back to the professionalization of education in the late 19th century, when the teaching of law and history separated. I'll talk first about the teaching of uh, law and then the teaching of history. Now, law and history became separate disciplinary practices in Western culture towards the end of the 19th century. Dicey and Maitland exchanged correspondence, and they were commentators upon this. Dicey, when he wrote The Law of the Constitution in 1885, was quite clear that though he was dealing with an historical artifact, the British Constitution, he was talking about it in the present tense. Um, Dicey says, I am not an historian, I am a lawyer. These are the mechanisms that drive the Constitution. In particular, he identified the phenomenon known as constitutional conventions. Likewise, Maitland said that there are two different forms of logic going on, what the lawyer does and what the historian does. I'll explain more in a moment. But Maitland spoke of the evidence of authority which is what the lawyer uses the past for, whereas the historian is interested in the evidence of logic. The historian is interested, interested in trying to figure out how people were thinking their logic in the past. Law as a discipline taught in the universities begins to become established in the mid-late 19th century. Uh, the Americans, more than the British, lead this. We see the rise of the university in the late 19th century. Law and history separate. Dicey was the first professor who was not a professor of law and history. Austin was a professor of uh, law, but no one attended his lectures because he was famously not a very interesting lecturer. Uh, Dicey went to Oxford, where he wrote his book, 
and constructed the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, which is uniquely a Oxford um, creation. Well, it's not now, but it was at the time. We also see in this period the professionalization of the practice of law. There are the procedural reforms of the early 19th century and the sharpening of professional discipline. The doctrine of stare decisis comes to be articulated more consciously. The de declaratory theory of the common law um, takes deeper root. And there is more conscious attention to sources and authority associated with um, the downstream effect of Benthamite positivism and formalism. Lawyers become a profession. So the teaching and the practice of law uh, becomes a much more professionalized business by the end of the 19th century. We need to remember that. Meanwhile, the same is happening with history. Historians like the lawyers are developing their own professional ethos at this time as they um, become established in the universities. The idea of history as a disciplinary, disciplinary practice in Western culture takes root earliest in Germany during the early 19th century. Uh, by the mid-19th century, it's associated with figures like Rila and a more especially a man called Ranka, Otto von Ranka, who wrote history in terms of high politics, but with regard for the sources. The historian works with primary material, artifacts from the past, so that they can construct an account of how the historical actors were operating, their frame, as it were, of reference. So the historian, Ranka said, uses archives, letters, papers, hieroglyphics, log books. All of those are primary sources to which the historian goes. This notion uh, is absorbed by the English, first of all by gentleman historian, like Carlyle, for example, writing on the French Revolution. His biographer, uh, Froude, uh, Froude took the professional obligation of the historian so seriously that he famously wrote a biography from Carlyle's papers that uh, described the state of Carlyle's marriage. It was a great Victorian scandal, but it was symptomatic of how historians were taking themselves seriously as um, professionals. The university historian begins to appear, Freeman, Seeley, Hallam, and into the 20th century. These British historians are writing what become the great Whig histories of Britain. These great Whig histories celebrate the rise of a parliamentary people. It is as though Britain were always destined. There's something about the air, there's something about the soil that was destined to produce these representative institutions. One of the great crescendos in this is Churchill. When he was in opposition, he writes his histories and they are in that mould. The tale, through archival sources of course, of the rise of a parliamentary people. Two world wars, uh, we find, and two world wars, and of course the phenom that phenomenon had its German equivalent, had its French equivalent. We find commentators, famously like Walter Benjamin, the French Annal, um, Butterworth, Herbert Butterworth, Butterfield, sorry, in um, England, reflecting upon history, and they come to see that history can be as much a form of propaganda, as of nationalist propaganda, as uh, propaganda itself and, and marching in the streets. So after the Second World War, there is a much stronger consciousness of the historian's voice. The narrative positioning that the interlocutor takes with the past through using the medium of the, the archives. The, profession, the, historians, the sense of the historian's professional obligation rises. It is the obligation to capture the past contingency and relate form the frame of possibilities of that era. We imbue the historical actors with the capacity to change their own future. They are invested, as we are now, with the belief that they can form their own destiny and their own progress. There is no sense that they are captured within historical forces against which they have no capacity to act. Records and archives 
are artifacts from and for their own time for the historian. When an historian approaches archives, papers, dispatches, and looks at them, they realize they are not messages in a bottle to the future. They are of their own time. So historians over the years have developed this consciousness of an obligation towards the humanity of the past. All things, this is, this, this is a point of utter, utter banality, but it's actually quite important to understand. All things human have historicity. All human enterprise inhabits time and space. Historians saw that their activity of interpretation was a socially constituted activity and that it had acquired a history. So interpretation, the very act of interpretation, is an exercise with historicity. Interpretation changes. I'm going to come to this because something lawyers can forget. Interpretation has a history. It changes. So um, now I'm going to contextualize common law Aboriginal title. What it was it was doing and my experience of it in terms of my education and my, particularly my postgraduate. Common law Aboriginal title was a doctrine devised to protect extant Aboriginal use rights. In Canada, it was, it was a response to uh, hydro development in northern Quebec, low-flying NATO flights over um, traditional territories, and to the century-long uh, argumentation about treaty rights in British Columbia. Aboriginal title in Australia, where it's called native title, was a response to intrusive mineral development in the outback, threatening traditional, particularly bauxite extraction, which was um, threatening um, Aboriginal um, traditional lives. Uh, the case that I brought in New Zealand was to protect extant Maori fishing rights, particularly in the rural remote regions around the coastline. So the way in which Aboriginal title was presented in Bourne was to protect rights that were being exercised. It was there to deal with extant rights. That's what Calder was doing, and that's how uh, Brian Slattery, Kent McNeil, when he published his PhD dissertation, and um, my work in the New Zealand setting, that's what we were doing in the 1980s. Now, accompanying this construction of a legal argument, there was also a subtle intellectual reconfiguration of that common law Aboriginal title as though it were an historical truth, as though the common law doctrine of Aboriginal title had always been there. The figure initially and most controversially associated with this is an Australian historian called Henry Reynolds. During the 1980s, those of us who were, it was a niche academic area, those of us who were writing on it, Brian, Kent, myself, were lawyers, but Henry Reynolds was an historian. His historical accounts of um, Australia in the colonial days depicted these common law principles as though they were a code, sets of rules formed in the mind of Crown officials that they shunned, ignored, trampled on. He wrote about Aboriginal title in that way in a couple of famous books. Politically, it was very important. It led to the Mabo case, to the recognition of native title, which had the impact in Australia of the Calder case here. So the history wars saw the Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, decrying people as Henry Reynolds as the black armband view of Australian history. Oh, we weren't that bad, really, were we? Um, uh, and a uh, certain reaction against the use of history um, for guilt, in other words, to pro prod and prompt government into negotiations and settlement. So you can imagine my surprise when I was in Toronto this year uh, in uh, giving evidence in a case when Doug Sanders uh, was in the witness stand as an expert witness and he was questioned about the Calder case. Uh, uh, when uh, Doug was questioned about the Calder case, he just shrugged his shoulders and indicated very nonchalantly as if to indicate that it was a mere adjustment. Uh, I was very struck by that because I thought this is the declaratory theory run rampant. 
uh, Doug Sanders, Ken Lysak, Tom Berger in particular, Frank Calder, were very much involved with the formulation of common law Aboriginal title during the early 1970s as a legal argument. And here it seemed Doug was rather disowning um, the impact of that case. This was because there had grown over the years two fallacies, the collapse of legal method and historical method into the notion of common law Aboriginal title. There is a Whiggish projection, in other words, there is projection of contemporary questions into the past. People in the past are seen to have been acting according to doctrine that the courts were to articulate a century later. You know, I, I keep saying, and I can't avoid the sarcasm here, the sarcasm is, well, strangely enough, Crown officials in 1854, 1870 and 1923 had no idea what the Supreme Court of Canada would say in 1984. Yet somehow these fallacies have come to interpret uh, certainly an approach to Can Canada's legal history and uh, the way in which the courts operate, as I'll explain. The two fallacies are the idea that the Crown has always been obliged to respect Aboriginal title as a matter of law. That is to say that treaties are there because the Crown had to do it. The other fallacy is associated with the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and that is the belief that the Royal Proclamation always obliged the Crown legally to follow a particular procedure as well as to obtain sessions. So these late 20th century ideas that start with Calder are seen as to, to be enduring historical verities and truths that were always there. This has become a blind spot for um, Canadian legal historians. I'll read you an extract from one written by a very eminent ca Canadian legal historian uh, who has edited a collection of essays on uh, Richard Risk and who shows great, great, great sensitivity towards the history of political thought except when it comes to First Nations. He writes, In a famous statement in 1969, then-Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau announced that there were no such thing as rights for Aboriginal people distinct from those held by all other Canadians. In a sense, he was right, for, no, for one could not find any judicial or legislative statement to the contrary in the 20th century. But listen to this. But those few legal historians who had looked at the question had found a variety of sources some cases, and also government policies, some dealing with areas that became part of Canada, others dealing with other parts of the empire, that said differently, that said that at one time it was part of the common law that indigenous peoples had rights in their land and other kinds of rights, but that legal tradition had been effectively erased from the law books and thus from the world view of society and politicians. Indeed, in Canada, it was so much lost that in 1927 it was made an offence to raise money for the purpose of prosecuting Indian land claims without the consent of the Superintendent General of Indians. So here we have a legal tradition that was erased, expunged. Here we have people in the past uh, operating by something that they're also rubbing out. We have, uh, but of course, who finds out about it? A few talented legal historians are able to say, no, those people are operating by something they don't know they're operating by, or else they're rubbing it out so the future doesn't know. This is conspiracy theory run wild. You don't just lose a whole tradition as though it were some um, Mesoamerican culture that gets disappeared, devastated by a um, satellite. This uh, same historian speaks of a memorandum written in 1917, locked, locked inside a cabinet in the Department of Justice until it is discovered years later as though it were the covenant of the Lost Ark hidden away because the truth about common law Aboriginal title was at the beginning of the 20th century too radiant, too devastating for the ordinary eye until, of course, the few talented legal historians later discover it. That just the world was not happening that way. That is just not the notion that was developing. Common law Aboriginal title was a doctrine devised in the 1970s to protect extant Aboriginal rights. It was not historical truth. You wouldn't have had the Calder case if that weren't the case, if that was not the position. Calder was a paradigm shift. It was a paradigm shift in terms of establishing 
the justiciability of Crown relations with First Nations. Until then, that was regarded as a matter of unfettered executive discretion. Courts would not intervene in the management of Crown relations with First Nations. That was the whole point of the Calder case. So, we have to historicize the idea of Crown discretion. It is like interpretation. It has its history. The Crown's relations with First Nations begin very gently and gradually. They begin with uh, the um, transatlantic settlement of uh, east, the eastern seaboard. The Crown deals with First Nations through its Virginia Company, through charters that are issued. These charters claim no rights over First Nations because they are predicated upon an early modern idea of sovereignty as rooted in the feudal idea of legions. So there is an idea of a personal jurisdiction of ruler over subject and of the necessity for subjects to exercise judicial or legislative powers over one another to have warrant from the crown. We are dealing with a royal prerogative, number of royal prerogatives there. The prerogative of incorporation is one of them. Foreign relations, Nexiat regno. Crown instrumentation for the new world contained no claim to inherent jurisdiction over tribes. It is only in the mid-late 18th century that more territorialized ideas of sovereignty begin to form. The Royal Proclamation of 1763, for example, refers to first the independent tribes, First Nations, as allies and subjects. Allies and subjects. Now, to modernize that, modernize, that is a contradiction. Um, but uh, it's a contradiction because we are using our territorialized absolute notion of crown sovereignty. There is no sense in 1763, oh, we're speaking in a contradiction, but let's do it anyway. They're not thinking like that. It's later eyes that say that's a contradiction because that is the doctrine of a later time. In the early mid 19th century, there's a sharpening of a consciousness of the nature of crown jurisdiction. Like all things British, it just muddles and muddles along and it develops. It develops in the 1820s through the 1830s in Upper Canada and Australia when the anxieties of officials about um, jurisdiction for criminal offences within tribes. Then in New Zealand in the 1840s, that by then that question is settled and you find government dispatches and opinions saying that. And so there is a sharpening of the idea of crown script discretion, which is of course associated with prerogative. The prerogatives that are engaged in the crown's relationship with tribes are not only the power to make land grants, which lies behind the Royal Proclamation of 1763 as well, but also in the administration of justice so that the crown is parents patriae and the tribal interest is meant to be represented in actions, for example, of trespass by Aboriginal protectors, as they're known, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, or by superintendents in um, British North America. So we have then a sharpening of the consciousness of crown discretion in a cluster of prerogative capacities linked to the crown's sovereignty. A feature of this time is that those prerogatives, though expressly conferred individually, are never cooked or baked into the express conferral of jurisdiction in Aboriginal affairs. That just doesn't happen. So governors exercise powers that are drawn from a variety of prerogative sources, but never, never, never bundled into a specific jurisdiction over Aboriginal peoples, even though it is recognised that the Crown has special duties in that relation. Because by then, those powers are being deployed and operationalised in a way that is very conscious of British obligation over subject peoples, informed by the politics of the time, by abolition during the 1830s, uh, the emergence of humanitarian, evangelical Christian humanitarianism, the foundation of the Aboriginal Protection Society, Church Missionary Society, London Missionary Society, and the notion of a civilising mission. 
Now, the notion of that mission itself, it's a human enterprise. It changes, changes, and it changes when Darwin comes along. It changes as a result of the Maori and the Zulu wars of the late 1850s and early 1860s. The mutiny in 1857, um, and also, of course, that ongoing 19th century British preoccupation with the cost of empire, and the antagonism between the colonial office and the city, and the rise of settler self-government following the Durham Report of 1839. There are all kinds of forces shaping and affecting the way in which Crown discretion is marshaled and used in dealing with indigenous people during this time. Confederation in 1867 sees section 9124 giving the Dominion Parliament jurisdiction over um, Indian, Indians and lands reserved for Indians. We then see a zone of Crown discretion becoming a legislative field. Becoming a legislative field, a division of powers requires judicial demarcation. So in the late 19th century, Canada sees what was an area entirely of Crown discretion becoming a legislative field allocated between federal and provincial governments. The allocation becomes necessary because section 9124 gives the Dominion Parliament jurisdiction, but the same BNA Act gives the provinces, the old provinces, the underlying ownership of the land. So it becomes necessary to determine the effect of a treaty or a session. This case law, whilst it is engaged in this allocative and resource-based exercise about the internal arrangement of the Canadian Crown, federal, provincial, carefully navigates around the executive discretion in the management of relations with First Nations. Those case laws are not the seed plot for Calder. Calder shifts the paradigm altogether. So Calder changes the theme of justiciability. Uh, those early cases, St. Catherine's Milling, the Indian annuities case, are about the allocation of legislative and executive authority. They are not about its exercise. So when we historicize crown discretion, we are looking at a prerogative power that gradually transforms into 9124, but in which notions of dis executive discretion remain strong. When we talk of executive discretion, oh, I can see all the public lawyers here um, wincing, because we, all, we know that judicial review is there. Well, of course judicial review is important. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But when we talk of an unfettered Crown discretion, it does not mean we are talking of an undisciplined discretion. The Crown's been sovereign. The Crown, as sovereign, is interested in maintaining consistency and regularity. The Royal Proclamation 1763 is a spectacular example of a disciplining of Crown discretion by means understood at the time. The Royal Proclamation centralises Indian policy, announces the principles upon which it will be based, says that First Nations can expect a particular procedure, settlers cannot enforce a direct purchase in the courts, the Royal Proclamation does not set up a procedure or rights enforceable against the Crown in its own courts. That's what called a signals the beginning of. No concept of judicial review inhabits the way in which bureaucrats conducted themselves in the 19th century. They're not all running around in the 19th century, oh, we better want to show what we're going to do because 100 years judicial review is coming. That's just not the way that people conduct themselves. So, likewise, the Crown disciplines its procedure. The comprehensive and the specific claims procedures, for example, established um, 81, 82 respectively, discipline the Crown so that in dealing with claims, it can behave in a consistent and regular manner. These processes are extra statutory. The resolution of, of First Nations claims is a matter of prerogative still. But it is a prerogative power that is regularized and dis disciplined through the procedures meticulous, painstaking, laborious, grindingly inconclusive for First Nations, of course but they are the means by which the Crown 
regularizes itself. Of course, judicial review means that there will be legitimate expectation with regard to processes that the courts can now monitor to ensure that there is evenness in the way in which the Crown conducts itself. Of course, that is part of the contemporary consciousness of how executive discretion is regulated and monitored by and through the courts. But there is still a notion there that the Crown as sovereign must regularise its conduct. So if we think about Calder, as I've been intimating, Calder was a case that was scaffolded by public law values of its time. It was, as I say, a legal argument devised in the early 1970s and developed by lawyers afterwards. It is not historical truth. It is utterly of its time. The public law values that lie inside Calder are judicial review, development, common law, a late 20th century, bridling, open-ended executive discretion. There are notions of non-discrimination and equality in Canada associated with the Bill of Rights, but also associated with the relevant international covenants. There is uh, the appearance of notions of public interest litigation and the easing of standing requirements. And there is also a much more basic notion of the amenability of the Crown to proceedings, a background of Crown proceedings. There is no notion of Crown proceedings occurring in the 19th century. So we can talk of Calder as very much a product of its own time. We can put it in historical context and we can see the important and profound change that occurs. We are historicizing the notion of Crown discretion. So we come to a case, a recent case this year, of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Manitoba Métis Federation case. Now, um, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to be controversial here. I think this is very sloppy reasoning by the Supreme Court of Canada. They are collapsing what lawyers and historians do. They speak of the honour of the Crown as a constitutional obligation, as though the officials administering the Manitoba Act, sections 30, 31, 3132 of the Manitoba Act should have known what the Guerin case was going to say in 1984. Uh, they jump between past and present. The Supreme Court of Canada infers a constitutional obligation, a lawful obligation, to historical actors who have no idea that it is there. Now, instead, I'm not saying that we should not judge the past, but we should be clear that when we judge the past, we are doing it as our own judgment, informed by our values, by what occurred in the past. Of course, if it's a terrible, horrible past, we have to say that. We can say that. But we shouldn't deprive our ancestors of their own agency and their capacity to have acted differently or to have changed their world. Now, I'm going to mention here my own role as a legal historian in the Ross River litigation. Uh, the Ross River concerns the Order and Council of 1870 by which Rupert's Land and the Northwest Territory um, came into the um, Canadian Confederation. The Order and Council referentially incorporates the joint address of um, both houses of the, Canadian, of the Canadian Parliament asking that the Crown observes equity and good faith in its dealings with First Nations. Now I was asked to explain how the notion of equity and good faith would have been understood in the late 19th century. And the answer is it would have been understood as an unfettered, open-ended crown discretion. A disciplined one, a monitored one, a one that had reporting back through appropriate channels, including accountability, responsibility to Parliament, newly invested in the Dominion, because it was no longer an imperial um, matter, Council, cross-examining me, regarded those words equity and good faith as capable of a stable and enduring interpretation, as though those words had always and only ever meant one thing. He was convinced that the use of the word equity in 1870 meant that there was the fiduciary duty. There it was, staring him in the face. And of course, you look at the historical material, there's no, that the F word is just, is just isn't there. Uh, it was it was Gurin 
that start, started that kind of talk, importantly, but it's not there a hundred years earlier. Meaning has changed. And so here I was put between the two spheres of my career, between, on the one hand, my early days as a lawyer and my later days as an historian. My role there was a court expert and historian. I could not tell counsel to do his job properly and to explain to the court that interpretation had changed. It had changed. Why? How? Because there was the Constitution Act 1982, Section 35, which could allow the court to take a different interpretation from that which was being taken in 1870. Contrary to how Tom Berger was depicting me, I'm not an originalist. But if you're going to change interpretation, it is a product of your agency, not a deprivation of agency of the agency of historical actors. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Manitoba Métis case is doing likewise. It is sloppy on disciplinary structures and roles. They collapse historical and present agency and um, they need much sharper awareness of um, the distinction between legal and historical thinking. Uh, because if you don't do this, then uh, you reduce the past to a crude, whiggish typology of good guys, bad guys, of um, a caricature in which the crown becomes a pantomime villain, twirling its moustache, conspiring against First Nations. And you turn First Nations ancestors into dupes, people who are maidens tied to a railway track because there's the train coming and the dastardly crown laughing. It just isn't like that. The past is a complex contingent place, and we should respect our ancestors just as much as we hope that those who come after us will respect the contingency with which we try and manage our own very difficult and turbulent times. I want to close with a quote from, from Maitland. Maitland said, and I will end on this, the only direct utility of legal history lies in the lesson that each generation has an enormous power of shaping its own law. I don't think that the study of legal history would make men fatalists. I doubt that it would make them conservatives. I'm sure that it would free them from superstitions and teach them that they have free hands. Thank you.